What's up, everybody? This is Illiterate. My name is Evan. My name is Taylor. I did oodles of research. And I watched a boatload of movies. Let's get into it. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We are doing this because Netflix has just released a new feature. And I'm a fan of Texas Chainsaw. My brother's a makeup effects artist. I've been a lover of the genre for years. Texas Chainsaw is, is, is very familiar for me. I said, wow, they made one that I liked for the first time in 15 years. I just went to bed nice, you know, just like, oh, I liked that movie. I was scared. I enjoyed some of the aesthetic decisions. And I got up Saturday morning to the reactions. And the reactions were vehemently trashed online. The horror community seems to be diametrically split. Uh, <laughs> As they often are. And and immediately, before Illiterate pops into my head, I'm going, I need to, I need to, whoa, 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 I need to watch the original. So I sat down with my wife. We watched the original. She had never seen it. It was really, it was a really great time. And I absorbed it in my modern adult <laughs> grown right. mind. And then I, I went further and I, and I watched the remake. And this is by Sunday night. And I'm realizing that I've done all the work for an illiterate episode, basically. <laughs> and I'm reading all the reactions online and I'm saying to myself, this is the story that people think they know. Yeah. But nobody has any idea. And so I thought, why? I, you know, when it dawned on me, I was like, this is a this is a perfect, a perfect excuse to open up one of the most iconic horror films ever made and talk about why in the world it's still enduring. 50 years after the original. Yeah. And I am on the other side, which I knew nothing about it at all, was never interested in it. So this was a whirlwind experience for me. And for those that are not as acclimated to it, it maybe is a little different than you think in some ways. So hopefully I can illuminate some of that. And then I looked at the aggregate reviews from different websites and the original 74 at best had an 83% rating amongst these different sites, all the others are a 44% or below. So it was never, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like we'll see how this all progresses yeah. and why are there nine of them, you know, <laughs> but the first one is in the New York Museum of Modern Art. How many massacres happened? Yeah, on there? Lord. <laughs> yeah exa exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Stop chainsaw production in Texas to pull them off the shelves. <laughs> What's happening here? So yeah, the, the context of this, we'll jump right into the first one. 74 is a year after The Exorcist, but this is mm -hmm. before Halloween, Friday the 13th, and yes. Nightmare on Elm Street. Go back and listen to our Scream episode if you want what yes, Scream, Scream is responding to. Yeah. Scream is responding to the craze of the 80s, about how the 80s really dialed in on the horror genre and we created these tropes. And by the time 1990 rolled around, it was all kind of played out and the genre looked like it was dead. Uh, so, so Scream came in to talk about all of those things, give some new life and reinvigorate while talking about what had happened to the genre. Yeah. What Texas Chainsaw really serves to do in 1974 is set up the 1980 craze. This is really right. the emergence of the the crazed killer on a chase, like chasing a girl down the street had not quite been done in the way that it had been done in Texas Chainsaw. And that evolves in just a few years. It really takes its own metaphor shape in Michael Myers in 1978's Halloween. Yeah, that was something I didn't know, this final girl trope. This is one yes. of the earliest ones yes. to do that. Ridley Scott of Aliens said that Texas Chainsaw Massacre was more influential than any other genre film in making Alien, which I Ooh, hadn't heard yes. that before. So that's super interesting that that is a precursor to even a subset of the genre, the sci-fi side of it. A little spoiler for, for later, but I wrote a review of my thoughts from this weekend of the original, and that is, I did not know that, that Ridley Scott summed no. it up in that way, but I but I summed it up in this way, it's as if this family lives on another planet, and that's where the horror is really derived, because it is so alien to us. Mm -hmm. At least I know I'm, I'm barking up the right tree. That's why we do the show, folks. Yeah. <laughs> so other movies this exact same year, 74, were interesting to me. Think about genre yeah. and a cynicism or a nihilism. The Godfather Part Two came out, which is the mob movie. Blazing Saddles, which is satire, Western comedy. Right. And Chinatown, which is noir, nihilism. Wow, yeah. So all of those are also coming out in 74 because Nation in Turmoil, Vietnam War, Oil Crisis, 
the destruction of youthful idealism from the 60s. So that, that though, yeah. I, I want to put a pin on, on just the the shift that really is happening when you break into the 70s there. We have for the first time the, an unfavorable war in the United States that the classes are going in different. Right. We're starting to see classes almost emerge because of progress working in, in certain concerted directions. And I think it's through the 70s that we we start to really boil out this distrust of the American system, the American government. I think that's all on the surface of what's happening those early years of the 70s. I so that, that's yeah. what's boiling up in the thematics here. That's what was new to me was not to lump this as much in with the cheaper, more cheesy teen romps of the 80s, but more this random brutality of an uncaring universe yes. that fits this in a different box than Halloween and Friday and yes. all, all that stuff. I, this I've has societal and yeah. cultural implications that are so strong, they almost like fly over you because you're. It, it, that's where the, the alien-esque mm -hmm. horror comes in is that all of the societal thematics fly over your head because you feel like you're on a different planet and you can't even process that <laughs> stuff yet. Yeah. So if this is such a forerunner, let's jump into who did this, why they did it, what they were looking at, what's true, what's not. Mm. Toby Hooper is the director, yes. co-writer. I, you know, in terms of the story here, there were different <laughs> accounts because he <laughs> had said different things, but I'll give the most common prominent one. He was just had graduated shortly before 30 years old when this finally got put together. So not not too far. And and there's no film industry in Austin at the time, but he is there, a bunch of hippies. And the idea of these college students in isolation in Texas, this ever-present Texas setting, if they step outside, there is a whole other world of Texas beyond their college enclave. Put a pin in that because I visited Texas many, many times. I've been out to some of the filming locations. I've been to the original house. I've been to the uh -huh. remake locations. If you have never been to the plains of Texas, there is a suffocating pressure to the emptiness and a stillness that is hard to really describe. Yeah. It, ha it carries with it an eeriness that I have not been able to replicate. <laughs> In, a, in other settings other than being deep in the forest or being in, in pitch black. For anybody who's not been out there but have seen the movies, the movies actually do a pretty good job of just giving the tone of what it is like to be somewhere where time stands still. Yeah, and for Toby Hooper and his long-haired hippie friends, they don't belong out there. Right. He had also witnessed some tragic violence. He was at University of Texas at Austin in August of 66, during the sniper shooting oh gosh, yes. situation and he had watched a policeman get shot in front of yeah. him. So yeah. the apocryphal story of the origin of this, there was a big Christmas crowd at this department store in 72 and he saw a rack of chainsaws <laughs> musing ironically to himself, that would be a good way to get through this crowd. <laughs> Goes home, he said the zeitgeist blew through this story came in about 30 seconds of all the characters and the thematics and what it meant and the hitchhiker mm -hmm. and, and all of it. The other context, because I was just curious about this, all the other things going on in the world, we had mentioned Vietnam War and whatnot, but just like write what's going on in December of 72, as he's saying, the zeitgeist blew through. What the heck does that even mean? <laughs> so Nixon had just- Thanks, Toby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll set it straight for you. Nixon had just won re-election. But the Watergate burglars were indicted, and soon more and more was going to be coming out about what actually happened. Uh. Nixon had ordered this bombing on Vietnam, the, the Christmas bombing, to deflect scrutiny. It was also the final manned moon mission, so it's the end of the space age. Oh, wow. Yes, yes, yes. Also, December 23rd, there was this discovery of plane crash survivors in the Andes that had rocked news. They were. Uh, there for 72 days, they survived. Mm -hmm. And then there was this really macabre confession that they credited all to cannibalism. They had to eat. Oh my gosh. And it was, I mean, I'll post links to some articles about it. It's horrifying. It wasn't like they murdered people. It was people sure. that had other people that had perished, but it was like, we have no food. We're in the frozen ice. So all of that oh happened gosh. in December while he's looking at the rack of chainsaws. Wow. 
Yeah, it's really all there on the surface, huh? <laughs> you can see a lot. I've always yeah. wondered, because I, you know, we'll get into the Ed Gein stuff, but I always mm-hmm. wondered where the cannibalism stuff itself emerged. And so it like, was literally in the news yeah, that yeah, month. That yeah, that makes total sense. Of course, film wise, other films in 68, Night of the Living Dead, another er- precursor indie horror which we covered if you want to go back to our Army of the Dead episode. Yes. Maybe we also talk about it then, but 72 this year is The Last House on the Left had come Mm. out. And so that I think maybe we covered in Promising Young Woman. Oh, yeah. Something like that. But yeah. We, we, we talked about or, this somewhere. Uh, woman in the window? No, I don't, one of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> regardless, so I thought it was interesting that he had made a film that, he, oh God, it's still out there when <laughs> somebody said they saw it. He was like, burn it. Eggshells. <laughs> Basically three people. It's this commune hippie house that sometimes it was improvised, no distribution. There's this strange otherworldly presence. And he said, basically, at these art houses, the second they turned on the projector, you saw the lighters turn on in the audience. People are just blazing it. (laughs) But they had a good time. Yeah. (laughs) So he realized with his co-writer, Kim Henkel, they both were like, the only film they can make without stars where the subject matter is the star is genre horror work. Mm -hmm. Literarily... They were, and I, this is directly, they had said they were trying to do sort of a post-60s Hansel and Gretel. Yes, yes. And go back to our Gretel and Hansel episode if you want what that's all about. They're watching culture at the time and they're taking hippies. They're taking the misplaced hippies in Austin, Texas and throwing them into an alien form. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and the gingerbread house and witch are super exactly. Imposed into you rural you take your yeah. hippies and they wander a little bit too far in the woods. What kind of world might they uncover? I mean, so this, the, I just am trying to drill in or at least highlight this the, the cultural, the societal aspects that are the driving force of this. Mm-hmm. I had seen also interestingly music. So there was a top 40 folk song because Hooper had said there was a song that he had heard. And then the person doing the article looked it up and it was not <laughs> timeline wise, actually what he must have listened to. Oh, really? But I found a song called dead skunk that came out right around this same time uh-huh. and maybe alludes to the rotting armadillo in the middle of the uh-huh. road. And people had attributed saying, Oh, this dead skunk song in the middle of the road rotting is an allegory about Nixon and then Interesting. The, the, the artist, okay. yeah, uh, yeah, the yeah, artist. I like was, that kind of yeah. stuff. <laughs> I'll post a link to the song, but the artist was just like, "No, it's just I saw a skunk and <laughs> a song about it." <laughs> that skunk stinking in the I middle. I wonder what of was it. on Toby Hooper's mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe it was that, but yeah, personally, in terms of the influence, he had said he had known a doctor who had bragged about making a mask from a cadaver during pre med yeah. in college. So that was a bizarre, what kind of friends do you have? But nothing so over, if you want to get to the Ed, Ed Gein stuff, we can, because that's kind of the, the true well, story. It's, yeah. yeah, it's the part of it that kind of gets brought out. Um, so nobody got murdered with a chainsaw. There was no massacre. <laughs> and what I didn't realize, there, yeah, there is an opening crawl that says this is a true story. And oh, the, yeah. the ori- I looked at the original. <laughs> they just yeah. lie. They just flat out lie. <laughs> yeah, the original poster says, what happened is true. Now the motion picture that's just as real. Two times in the poster <laughs> do they say that it's true. <laughs> False. So this is the first big America's most bizarre and brutal <laughs> crimes. <laughs> Never happened. Nobody is a chainsaw murderer. No. Uh, so Ed Gein was a killer in Plainfield, Wisconsin. Yeah active during the 1950s. He was more of a grave robber than anything and fashioned things out of the bodies that he stole. He did murder, I think, just one woman. One or two that, yeah. Exactly. Uh, But the the thing that's really taken from this is his house and the things made out of human bodies. This, This penetrates cinema in a way that few characters, few people really do. Uh, the Silence of the Lambs is is well, yeah. well on based on him in terms of Buffalo Bill's character. 
Yeah. So this becomes one of the focal pieces of Texas Chainsaw when they go into the house and they see they see all the things made out of people's bodies. And then ultimately, it makes sense when you are introduced to Leatherface wearing human skin. Uh, all of those things start to fit together. And then the the cannibalism aspect mm-hmm. fits fits right in. Then in the film, you see they almost have this strange economy. <laughs> where oh, there's really? the, the where the two brothers are the killers and the curators, and then the father figure is the cook. Uh, and then yeah. he that actually is, runs the store, the gas store where they sell the barbecue, which is supposedly made of people. And it, it creates this odd, strange economy. Um, right. But, but, uh, yeah. So the, 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 all of the Ed Gein stuff is really uh, is is all of the things made out of bodies. And uh, that, that is the, in the house. Yeah. Probably the loosest inspiration because people would look at it and be like, oh, so Ed Gein killed people with a chainsaw. And, he, and it's like, right. No, completely. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. He, he was caught in 57. The other one that gets pulled into his name is there was a Wisconsin writer that was all caught in the news of oh. this Robert block. And he incorporated the creepy mother relationship. Cause that was mm-hmm. a big part of Ed Gein's story mm-hmm. into two years later, his hit 59 mm-hmm. novel psycho, which yep. then becomes Boom, baby. the 60 film, but yeah, the, the mass. Well, and then there you can follow the genre thread off a different direction. Cause you could trace that line directly, directly to Halloween, then directly to Scream. Yeah. So if Ed Gein is intrinsic to psycho, Ed Gein is intrinsic to what horror became. Yeah, it is. It's just a shame because I looked at it at face value and it's such a misnomer being like the lie that it's based on a true story. And then anywhere you look, you type in Ed Gein into YouTube and then all the sub leather face, this and that. And it's like it was a piece of his story, but also a bunch of pieces of other stories and Toby Hooper's weird medical student friend and Hansel and Gretel. You know, it was a lot of different things. It's as much real as any movie you've ever paid to see. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, the uh, the, the way yeah. that this creative process was put together and these things emerge is no different than basically most films that are trying to say something about what's going on in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And what they were trying to say was not well received at the start, <laughs> let to say the least. One of the things just before we get to the weird distribution stuff was the shock factor because I hadn't seen it and I didn't know anything about it. There is not as much on-screen gore as you'd think it would be famous for. No. And even so mm-hmm. the I looked at the rating system, there wasn't a PG-13 at the time, but Toby Hooper was trying to go for a PG rating. Whoa. Cuz it really? just yeah, he said cuz it was it was basically PGRX. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said, "Well, I but in spite of all the cuts attempted, like he sent it to the ratings board and they gave him revisions and he tried to get it to a PG, but it ended up getting an R. And this is in the 70s. So, you know, that's, it's just because it's terrifying. <laughs> like that, wow. that's, uh, you know, Jaws would get the PG in the next year. That's right. wild. <laughs> and then uh, it led to, yeah, Steven Spielberg in Temple of Doom getting the PG when he rips his heart out. <laughs> we can't, <laughs> we have to have something in the middle here. Right. Yeah. And now, and I'm trying to think about it because it, you know, number one, they don't have the budget. They right. do not have the budget to throw around a bunch of blood and have these effects and gore and skin and all that stuff. They really do not. So then number two, that implores them to be more creative. That mm-hmm. implores them to make sure these scenes are leading up to an emotional crescendo to a point. Because if you are doing that, it doesn't hardly matter how much blood is in the scene if your audience is emotionally invested. So yeah. it becomes much more about paying attention to the wire act that you are walking instead of what it looks like. They frame it out all the time. Mm. The entire movie is them trying to frame out what's actually happening, which has always been a technique of film that I I implore that I am akin to is I would rather get your mind active and imagining what's just beyond the edge of the frame than just think that I can shock you with what I can come up with. I think it's yeah. always more effective to go with, I want you to be begging me to pull that frame down to show you. I want your mind to be going in all sorts of different mm-hmm. directions about what you are not seeing. That's what happens in this movie. And it's still a movie about a cannibal. You know, we're not saying it's uh It's not not gory, but it's not, it's nothing like you would be thinking it is. Right. So that was new to me. So then with the distribution, Evan, this is one of the tasks he had me look <laughs> into because- It's even little known amongst people that know things about the films. They had a tough time getting it. We might never know how much money 
this movie made. <laughs> Just preface yeah. it with that. And so here's the reason. Uh, needed distribution, Universal, Columbia, these other places, they're not going to take it up. It's, it's <laughs> getting buzz in the small art house midnight showing places, but they really need it to get out there. So remember how The Godfather 2 came out this same year. Toby Hooper goes to Bryanston Pictures, who, and this will blow your mind, oh, last no. week we covered Pam and Tommy Butchie from the porn <laughs> business, the Colombo <laughs> crime family. Yeah. This is his money laundering production <laughs> company. <laughs> I told you it's the perfect topic this week. We went one, right from one to the other, yeah. direct line. Oh my god! I love when there's a connection mind. between uh, the episodes, but this one is the, probably incredible. the most bizarre we've had. Yeah, so Butchie, absolutely, the, absolutely. Yeah, the, like you said, the accounting practice is not great. Cheated him out of millions. The back to the the porn business. They had released Deep Throat, this full on porn film. It wasn't a little. Mm -hmm. It was a full on thing in su in the summer of seventy two. So the summer before he sees the rack of chainsaws. Mm -hmm. That movie, Deep Throat, made potentially between 30 to 50 million on a $20,000 budget. Good Lord. The mob has to launder that money somewhere because this is an illegal porn film. You know, it's obscenity <laughs> across state lines. There's right. tons of things that the FBI is trying to get them on outside of just doing this film. Wow, so, this is just like Pam and Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of the stuff that's wild with the things that I already said, they they were responsible for a lot of the salacious marketing. So they made the iconic poster that says, this is all true. Wow. And wow. then in terms of it being in the Museum of Modern Art, which was a huge situation that people were like, this is crazy. This has some oh, prestige. God. They sent the print to the MoMA as a gift and then used that in advertising saying, this is part of the MoMA's permanent collection. <laughs> and then when reviewers in the media... <laughs> <laughs> so can I send Steven Spielberg a copy of a short film I made and be like, Steven Spielberg owns my movie? His pride. Well, then, because then, our, you know, interviewers and reviewers went to the MoMA and they said, is this true that this is there? And they said, well, technically, yes. And they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> they, they set him up. That's incredible. I so love it. Oh my that's, God. All, that's all Butchie's uh, dealing. I mean, they're not lying. Here. They have it, don't they? <laughs> I mean, we do have it. <laughs> yeah. So... This business, the Bryanston Pictures, has tons of litigation that the FBI is doing. The business is crumbling. The investors on Texas Chainsaw Massacre sued them. But Bryanston mm. was like, you don't have the balls to sue us. Eventually, you know, in the mafioso way, with yeah, the two yeah, tough yeah. guys on the side, eventually they go bankrupt because they were busted on the obscenity charges and they flee and you can't find them. And Oh, my God. It's a so <laughs> New Line purchased the rights in 83 and settled with the cast and crew for who knows what it was supposed to be, but some portion of what they should have gotten for it. Wow. And it was funny reading these articles from the FBI side. There was an FBI trainer that was would use this as a bit in his training of new FBI recruits. And he would say, how many of you saw the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? You know, 80% of the hands go up and yeah. he says, congratulations, you sent two and a half dollars of your money to the Colombo family in Fort Lauderdale. Oh. So who knew? You supporting crime. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, you idiot. <laughs> oh, man. So that's how you this thing got out there. blame the movie going audience yeah. <laughs> But who oh, knew? That's, yeah. yeah, that's how it got out there. Nobody, nobody knows that. Most people that I that even adore this film uh, have very little uh, detail on that story. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely insane that it could be, it could be the most successful independent film of all time. We will just never actually know. Because it was distributed by the legitimate <laughs> mafia. Mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Let's chuck right along to the rest of what the heck happens after this. Right. Nine films in total, a weird video game in the 80s. <laughs> but part two was interesting to me in that it was a bit in on the joke, I guess, spoofing horror sequels mm -hmm. because Halloween- I've seen yeah. it. I just didn't rewatch it in, uh, for this, but I, I've seen it uh, several times. Yeah. Uh, from what I saw, Halloween, Elm Street, Friday, they all had their franchises up and running by the time this sequel comes yeah. out in 86, over a decade later. So wow. Toby Hooper is still on it, right? And he's, it's it's like how the generation sold out in the 80s. And the poster <laughs> looks like the Breakfast Club. 
Yeah. And it's yeah. really strange. <laughs> it is very strange. The, most of the film takes place underground. Uh, the, the family has been run underground in this, into the system of caves. Oh. Uh, and then there is a hell-bent sheriff, a, a dual wi- chainsaw-wielding sheriff who is determined to track down and take down this family. The movie is worth watching just for the sheriff character alone oh, really? because he is one of the most insane law enforcement <laughs> figures I've ever seen committed to film. And I can't believe that they actually made this movie because it it takes what in the first film comes off as near documentary realism. Yeah. Well, it's a and true it, story, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it is a document. That's yeah. real footage. Uh, um, it takes characters from what felt like you were witnessing and it transports them into this satire of its own self. Mm -hmm. Like you said, all of these other franchises have popped up and you know, they're, they have, they're playing their stake and they're building their audiences. And they're honestly, what happened with the original set up so much of these that it, became time to almost talk about what had happened mm-hmm. <laughs> in a way. And that, and that is kind of like underneath the surface of that film is going like, what have we done with horror guys? <laughs> That's the ever evident question. I had seen somebody even saying it's like playing off of the concept of cannibalism. It's eating itself tur- yes. turned <laughs> into a mass produced commodity processed, prepared for consumption. Here you go. Here's the sequel. Oh, that's beautiful. Uh, it's, that's that's perfect. And and I think it really capstones it with like the the poster is obviously the Breakfast Club, uh, <laughs> and and that alone starts to tell you exactly what the movie is truly saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So ninety ninety five, and then the O three remake comes mm-hmm. out. Let me just set something up for you. So there were several movies released in the seventies, eighties. So like, I'll just I'll just list them for you. Friday the Thirteenth. It's Alive, The Last House on the Left, My Bloody Valentine, Sorority Row, The Stepfather. Are you familiar with all those? Yeah. Most oh, wait. Of them, sorry. Yeah. That wasn't the 70s and 80s. That was, <laughs> that was the year 2009. You got me. I walked right <laughs> into that one. <laughs> all of those were remakes that came out in just 2009. So how in I the probably world? probably saw most of them. <laughs> <laughs> so the first one that really was a failure, but in an interesting way in 98, Gus Van Sant's Psycho remake, yeah, which was yeah. shot for shot, line for line, like an identical recreation. And they're, really but is. and they're like, well, that didn't work because <laughs> it didn't make sense because it was like the '60s dialogue and blocking and all of that. So in a way, it's like, how do you reinterpret the themes again in a different way? So this is you can speak to kind of the O3 remake starting the craze of this of like we're going to remake it and try to have something to do with the Iraq War instead of the Vietnam War. Or, who knows right. how any of them fit. Yeah. So when my wife and I finished the original, one of the first things that she said is like, could you imagine if they had a budget? <laughs> we got that gift. <laughs> 2003's Texas Chainsaw Massacre stands to ignite the craze that Taylor just talked about. But there's a lot going on in it that I think people really missed. I think a lot of those titles that you named for lack of better verbiage, were unoriginal in terms of expanding on their properties, original thematics, trying to dig a little bit deeper. This is where I actually think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre succeeds. And I think it's why it helps set up all of this. Is I mentioned earlier that the original film presents this type of economy Mm -hmm. of the family. That becomes central in the remake as the expansion. How is this possible? How does it work? It does a good job of not imitating right. or retreading. Like they saw what, with the Psycho one. Yeah, they can't. Exactly. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. in terms of what it's trying to do for reboots in general, and this is this is across genre now, uh, it started with this. Yeah. Uh, but now we're doing it with superheroes on the you know billion dollar franchises. <laughs> It started right here, yeah, basically. Yeah. I think I think Scott Kozar and the, the team at Platinum Dunes and their development team was really doing the right work here in terms of how can we do this and please everybody without just trying to imitate because that's not possible. Yeah. And especially with the budget and the production value that they had, they were never going to come back with something that looked like 1974 independent film. Yeah. So like I think like you said, with you and your wife watching it saying, oh, it needs a bigger budget. This was 10 million. 
and made 80 million, but it could have stopped there. Like if this didn't work, it could have ended there. You had mentioned Platinum Dunes as the production company. So I looked into that. That was another one of my tasks. This was uh, (laughs) Michael Bay and Friends. Boom, baby. None of y'all saw that coming. (laughs) (laughs) He's he's responsible. And then it makes sense when you look at it. 2001 was when this company started. He had already done Bad Boys, Armageddon. And his and the and I love the idea behind this company. The idea behind this company was let's do small budgets. The movie is the star and we're going to give first time filmmakers the support that they need to make a good movie. Well, it's also uh, a lot of like how he got his start. So he gives a lot of his commercial and music video exactly. brethren. Exactly. Yeah, their chances. That is exactly how they find Marcus Nispel, the director of uh, the remake. Mm-hmm. He is, becomes one of the biggest uh, music video directors through the 80s and 90s. Janet I mean, Jackson. worked with everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody, everybody. And just coincidentally, the cameraman that he buddies up to throughout his entire music video advertising career, none other than Daniel Pearl, the cinematographer of the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh. They call Marcus Nispel. He agrees. Marcus turns around, calls Daniel. He agrees. Daniel turns around <laughs> after hanging up the call and goes, what in the world did I just do? I just told every. I, I just told them I would do it without even a second guess. I didn't even state my terms. I told everybody for 30 years or for 25 years that I would never do another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I would never do it again. He hated the production of that movie was grueling and insufferable. (laughs) And I won't go into, you can go, there are plenty of of details about how awful the making of the original movie was. Just imagine throwing all those dead animal parts in a house, cooking it in 120 degrees and living there for 20 days. Um, He said he would never do this movie again. Just because Marcus Nispel is signed on, he goes, absolutely, I'm there. Boom, there's your team. Yeah. It is just in the in the counterpoint of this, the the because we already talked about it, but it's worth bringing up in this sphere is another guy who did TV commercials, 2004, Zack Snyder does the Dawn of the Dead remake. Yes, yes Another yes. horror remake. And now he's known as this flashy, over-the-top, stylized started in commercials and music videos so this is really where the reboot mania begins yeah you could say that marcus nispel getting hired and the success of that helps uh, mm-hmm. Zack snyder get hired yeah uh, yeah to for do sure that movie that's and that's incredible that's absolutely i think that tracks <laughs> and so we've got the name recognition of the original horror property with the upping of the cgi technology yep. saying will that help the budgets will that help with the scares so then just blasting through the mess of films that come after, and this is going to sound horrible on purpose, but 2006 is the prequel to the reboot that they've yes. done. And 2013 is a sequel to the original redone. 2017 is a prequel to the original redone. And 2022 is a now what they call requel, which is a revised <laughs> sequel <laughs> to the original <laughs> because that has already happened once in 2013. So oh, this is where we're at now with the oh. new film in 2022. Oh, yeah. So the 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 original sequel re- <laughs> the, <laughs> the 2013 one Chainsaw 3D I thought was one of the worst things I had seen in the theater in, in recent memory. And and I thought really truly for real the franchise was basically dead. Even in 3D pretty- it couldn't <laughs> <laughs> I, I and then when the next movie was coming up, I was basically validated in that because it was pretty much a TV movie and being like, oh yeah, so it's even moving further away mm-hmm. from a theatrical pull. I was pretty shocked, and I think a lot of the horror community was pretty shocked when suddenly Legendary Pictures are saying, "Well, we have a new one <laughs> ready to go." <laughs> yeah, some of the situation around it you asked me to look into. David Blue Garcia is the director. You hadn't heard of him. No, never. Yeah. I, I, as far as I know, he's he has very, almost no credits. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm I'm very, very intrigued as to how where he came from. I mean, how <laughs> they even find how do they even know his name? Yeah. Um, so the the original setup for this, Chris Thomas Devlin was a is a screenwriter who had a blacklist screenplay in 2018 mm-hmm. and then also did this. This is his first feature. The blacklist screenplay has not come out yet. It's in production. Mm. So this is a first for the screenwriter. And then there were different directors on this. Andy and Ryan Toehill, Mm. they had only one feature that they had done called The Dig, 
and they had put them on. They're Irish, and they had several Irish actors, which are in the film. They hmm. filmed, and I don't know what this means for anything, but filmed in Bulgaria, not in Texas. So this was a foreign, you know, not foreign filmed, but they had to recreate Texas in Bulgaria. Yeah. Uh, and legendary, and who knows, the, I couldn't find the details because they don't put this, but the original two directors, the twin brothers, were replaced a week after. They had shot for a week and then they exited, you know, they say creative differences. Who knows who who Good did Lord. what for who, <laughs> but oh my gosh. Uh, they so then they had to get somebody else. So then they just metaphorically like helicopter on the front lawn of David Garcia. <laughs> hey, can you do this? You can reshoot the first week. You don't have to use what they used, but he had only ever done one. I mean, similar fifty eight thousand dollar budget film at the Dallas International Film Festival. He had done commercials, saw some right. interviews, real nice guy, but just seems like very much thrown into this. If Hollywood comes to you and says, hey, right. we've got this thing, you've got to start tomorrow. We're flying you to Bulgaria. Can yeah. you do yeah. this? Um, I guess I'm taking the job. I, you know, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so he finished it off and, of course, added certain things and added different, you know, his sensibilities and probably some different crew members. Well, but yeah. Number one, I, I want to. It's not it's, it's not a great it's not a great movie. It's not a perfect movie by any means. Yeah. I liked it a lot, and one of the th and a few of the things that I think that due to his influence were the right decisions, may or maybe not, maybe you know, well, yeah. I don't, I don't know, but nobody acquires Colin Stetson to do the score who is not artistically adept. Who is he? Colin Stetson is a saxophonist, a, a musician who has pioneered uh, some really amazing uh, techniques. In, in music, uh, number one with with saxophone circular breathing. I had a friend who was all about Colin Stetson and <laughs> was really studying how to do this. He actually found out how to do it. He scored one of my movies using this technique. But as soon as I heard it, I thought of a buzzing bee's nest and it, it sounded like fear and it sounded like terror. Mm -hmm. And in the moment I heard this texture of sound back in probably 2013, I said, this has got to be the score for a horror movie. Yeah, I used it in, in for some science fiction junk, but finally, I, I you know I finished this movie Friday night, and I see Colin Stetson's name pop up on the on the screen, and I'm jumping off of my couch. I'm now engaged because Colin Stetson does not become a part of this picture just because somebody's friends with him or whatever. Uh, that is a that is a pretty uh, that's a pretty educated choice. That's an artistic choice, and I don't think that. That's not because of Garcia. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, what. But then I guess uh, the question becomes because we talked about the first one and and its thematics yes. and it's yes it's so viscerally unique. It's kind of the reboot question of like how do you tell the same scary story twice, making it meaningful both times, but then also revising. Yes, because you can't do the seventies thematics of hippies in Austin. You, well, yeah. then you take the hippies out. And then you replace it with social media and gentrification. Yeah. That's what this largely effectively does. You're not supposed to like any of the main, any of the, any of the characters except for the two sisters. That's it. All the other characters, forget about it because it is these kids who have kicked him out of his home basically and killed his adoptive mother. Yeah. Um, so then where do you think the scrutiny gets validated with this and the divisiveness with oh yeah uh, well I, <laughs> the more i look at it the more i feel as if i feel like i'm on the bus right <laughs> and for people who might not have seen this movie there the movie leads up to a a climactic moment where all of these investors are trapped on a bus and leatherface steps onto the bus with the chainsaw and you can imagine what happens from there on out but when i i, I feel like i'm on the bus i feel like my generation is on the bus yeah um what I would say is I think myself, my generation could do a little bit better in the area of understanding how we can be the villain sometimes. Well, and that's also this very movie much does not. Yeah. This movie does not it does not necessarily like us. And if you know that going in and you're trying to understand what it is saying, then there might be more there to discover. Uh, I don't think this is a movie that really likes anybody with an age lower than 40, probably. Like, I, I it's um, when I look at it this way, it's almost no surprise that Twitter doesn't like the movie because the movie does not like Twitter. <laughs> the movie, right. like, Twitter is on the bus. <laughs> 
I, that is really what I am gleaning from everything is like the reactions from this is like, oh, I hate the characters. Yeah, well, you are the character. <laughs> like, like that is really what uh, I'm getting to. And I'm putting myself in that category. Yeah. And and I think that's an exercise that we all should be a little bit more willing to and a little bit more flexible to do is be, be willing to see ourselves as the bad guy because Leatherface emerges as a writer's anti-hero here. And and that's a hard pill to swallow for a generation that can be self righteous at times. Yeah, because <laughs> I think the the first one, from what I understand, also that's the the reason it's so provocative and shocking in seventy four is because well you're going to side with the young people going out, not right. realizing they don't know what they're doing. They shouldn't be yes. there. Yes, this town and or this family has you, been. What you have um, in the original is a bunch of hippies telling a slaughterhouse professional. Uh, that the new way they do it is better. <laughs> now, you get into the semantics of that conversation, and they're right. That's beyond the point. Yeah, it's looking at... They have a point with progress going in the right direction. What they do not have is empathy or compassion or tact for how they're telling the people who need to adapt and change. That's exactly what's happening in the new film. Yeah. I do wonder, my my final thought with it is... The question of, which is a whole, I mean, we bring it up all the time because we talk about adaptations and things, but like mm -hmm. reboots as a whole versus doing something new, <laughs> speaking to this, like bringing right. something back for the 10th time, you must know Poltergeist, the classic film oh, yeah. from 2015 oh, yeah. I'm talking about. <laughs> gotcha. I, I saw no 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 I knew what you were doing. I saw that I saw that remake at the Plaza Theater Atlanta at midnight yeah. opening night and it was So the not. yeah, so the original in 82 <laughs> was directed by Toby Hooper who did this. Steven Spielberg's script Suburban yes. Life in the Reagan Era yes. speaking directly to the 80s. The 2015 version oh, yeah. written by Pulitzer Prize winning playwright Sam Rockwell's in it, Rosemary DeWitt's in it. It shows a downwardly mobile family for the mid 2000s. They're on iPhones and iPads. It's all pretty good, but was forgotten. Yeah. Maybe I'll check I guess it out again. My thing being like forgotten immediately. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't make a splash. And by that time, it's coming out. We're so far <laughs> into this horror movie remake that now, but what's really happening in, in, in the industry is they're looking to see how they can break out that formula into other genres. We are, the, the horror is yeah. played out. What about superheroes? <laughs> we can reduce Spider Man, right? <laughs> that's what's happening right then. Yeah. Texas Chainsaw taught them how to do that. <laughs> basically. Yeah. So we'll see what 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 comes of this one whether it will be another Poltergeist 2015 or you know. What I what I thought the remake and the prequel are missing the societal things. It's following a narrative a, a narrative pull. You did not see either working in Texas Chainsaw 3D or Leatherface the TV movie thematically almost nothing really going on. <laughs> Right. Uh, and so that's where I'm left with the new one going, wow, okay, this movie is vehemently about something. But is, it, is it right? Not the, not, the, not the point. Again, like, are, are, are they right in, in the van talking about the new way they kill, you know, yeah. in the original? Uh, the new way they kill versus the old way they kill. And you have a college student saying, but the new way is better, very insensitively to the person whose livelihood depends on that. You know, yeah. the, the Friday night. When I actually saw myself on the bus, I saw my generation on the bus. I saw referendums of things that uh, the, the the movie had a point of view, and it was actually talking about things that make up my world in a way that related to how the original operated. Is it? A, is it like? Does it feel like it's right out of that movie? No. <laughs> uh, is it incredible? No. Is it a great movie? No. Yeah. Was it uh, was it one of the best Texas Chainsaw sequels we'll ever get? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, Thank you guys for sticking with us. This was a great one. I know I was super excited about this one, but let us know what you thought. Uh, did you like the new one? Did you not like the movie? I'm on the bus. Are you on the bus? I don't know. Let us know what you are interested in you never know when we'll do an episode based on that thing you want to know all about so what are you excited about coming out reach out to us at illiterate pod and get in touch with us let us know what you'd like to see an episode on um, make sure you rate us please give us a rating on apple spotify wherever you rate your podcast please give us a rating it helps us out so much if you're an avid listener and your eyes glitter every time you see our episode <laughs> pop up on friday please share with a friend 
that's how we get the word out, having you share with others. So, yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us, and we will catch you next week. Yeah.